Hi guys, Miss Wood here. I'm going to teach you about rainforest ecology, specifically ecological relationships. Um, that little guy in that picture is a squirrel monkey. They are about mm, like a foot tall and they travel in groups of about 40 to 60 um, through the forest. That guy is actually eating a banana, believe it or not. So what are ecological relationships? Um, there's a couple different examples. It could be predator, prey, and competition, or something called symbiosis, which there is three examples of. And you'll see pictures and examples of that in this slideshow. Um, in a tropical environment, there's a abundance of resources, and all of the organisms, plants and animals, uh, compete for them, which causes them to kind of become highly specialized, and some even depend on one another for survival. This is Manu National Park. It's a rainforest in Peru. This is where I traveled to when I was in college and actually researched um, and observed in the rainforest and lived there for about three weeks. So the Manu National Park is found in Peru near, um, on the other side of the Andes Mountains. And it is also part of the Amazon rainforest, which you can see in that image. Um, it's near the bottom left. And it's near the end of the um, Amazon River. Uh, so, anyways, that's where we're talking about. So when I'm talking about all these animals um, in this most biodiverse place in the world, where there's more animals and more plants than almost anywhere else, um, that's where these examples are from. So here's just a couple of pictures to give you an idea of what my trip was like. So the top left is actually um, the kitchen dining hall where we would eat. The top middle is one of the two-person bungalows that I stayed in. There's me at Machu Picchu, uh, which we visited. Uh, and the bottom middle is a picture of one of our lodges. And the bottom left is the boats we traveled on. So to get to these places where um, the animals you're going to see, you have to travel by a long bus ride and a long boat ride, um, almost a day and a half worth of travel to get there. So field notebooks is what uh, you keep when you are a biologist in the field. And these are some pages of notes that I took when I was there um, in the rainforest. So first up is predator-prey relationships. And the first one I have is a very powerful predator. It is the black and white caiman. The white caiman on the bottom left and the bottom right uh, they're smaller, but they're still predators, but the black caiman can become really, really big. They're really similar to alligators and crocodiles, but they are different. So here's a video of a black caiman on the muddy side of the river. Black caiman. Let's see I'm slightly moving there. Sorry for my goofy uh, narration. She's coming for us. I'm backing up. I'm backing up. Uh-oh. He's in the water now. He's still there. Yeah. Alright, so that was video one. Video two is one on the beach so you can get a better idea of how big they are. Black Cayman. He's moving his tail where the water is. Uh, another example is something that prey can do. So prey can also have adaptations to help them evade a predator. This is an owl moth, um, and when its wings are closed, it has that what looks like an eye. So predators believe that it's a bigger animal and maybe won't bother it as much. It's called a form of mimicry, where they are mimicking looking like something else. Um, these guys can also be um, in a parasitic relationship because parasitic wasps will attach themselves to the butterfly's wings and then when the eggs are laid, um, they'll attack the eggs. So that's another form we'll talk more about later. Uh, this one's awesome. My, one of my favorite animals is the jaguar. Um, and you can see that even though you don't think it would be camouflage, it is really hard to see in the type of leafy greens that are on the beach uh, sides of the rivers, which is where jaguars often are found hunting because other animals will also be there. So if you can't find it yet, if you haven't seen him, his tail is here and his head is right here. Um, <laughs> you can see his eyes kind of glaring out. He's probably hunting. 
couple more pictures. Um, when I was there, over the two times I was there, I've been able to see five t jaguars total. Um, and a lot of all of them were on the riverside, thankfully. <laughs> it would be kind of scary. This is another top predator, the anaconda. It is um, considered to be endangered, I believe. And what it does is it eats its organisms, and it's found kind of basking in the sun to digest their food. So they'll be there for hours and hours after they've eaten a big meal. Another predator is called an ocelot. Super cute, but it is a... Um, consumer. It's a carnivore and it's just one of the smaller cat species. Another predator-prey relationship is spiders with their prey. And this one is uh, called an orb spider. It has a very strong web. And for those of you who are grossed out by spiders, I apologize. But if you're not, you should watch this video of a spider wrapping up its prey. It's pretty incredible what they can do with their... <laughs> Yeah. This is brutal. When? Oh, there he goes. Oh, oh there he goes. So cool. Oh, oh, he's feasting tonight. Well, watch the tail. Take those back. Behind this Yeah. Oh. Almost. All right. So that was pretty cool. The next thing is a prey adaptation. Um, and this is the poison dart frog. It's a creeps. Poison, um, and then if the predator eats it, it could become sick or even kill it, depending on the size of the organism. Another cool prey adaptation would be another kind of camouflage. This is called a glass frog, which is actually clear, and it kind of becomes whatever color it that it's on. So in this case, it looks more green because it is on a green leaf um, environment, but they can adapt and change um, how good they hide because they're clear. So that's pretty cool. Um, so now we're going to get into our examples of symbiosis. So symbiotic relationships are, it literally means living together. And this can be mutualistic, which is when both organisms in the relationship benefit. Commensalism is where one organism benefits and the other does not. And parasitism is where one benefits and the other is generally harm. So let's start with the last one, parasitism. So one is this parasitic strangler fig tree. So you wouldn't think of trees and plants being parasites in a way, but this tree will start to germinate in the canopy of any tree up in the branches. And then it slowly, as it grows, it sends its roots down to the ground where it will eventually root itself, get bigger and stronger. And then eventually it will just take all the nutrients from the tree it has wrapped itself around and take over that tree spot. So in this picture, you can see a little bit of evidence of like maybe the old tree, but this whole thing here is the parasitic Strangler, strangler fig tree. Another interesting example, and not necessarily a type of parasite you might think of, um, but these oropendula birds, they make these hanging nests. That's where they lay their eggs. But there's an example called brood parasitism. And this is when maybe another bird, and in this case it's called a giant cowbird, it will lay its eggs in the oropendula's nest and the oropendula raises them as their own. So that might take away food resources and resources from the babies of the oropendulas and giving them to the cowbird. So the cowbird is benefiting, um, and the oropendula could be negatively um, ex having negative effects from it. So here's a picture of the cowbird, top right, oropendula, one of the oropendulas at the bottom, and a picture of all those hanging things. Um, and like I said, it's a type of symbiosis because it's an interaction between two animals. Um, but there you go. All right. Another type of parasites is just something that one or like an animal will ingest, which is to eat. So jaguars being at the top of the food chain have eaten an animal, which ate another animal, which ate another animal, which ate a plant. Um, and parasites actually move up the food pyramid, up the food web. So jaguars really could have a lot of um, parasites in them. Could be beneficial, could be not. Um, but that is an example of parasites. Another weird example is this ant, which has um, the one on the left, picture A, is a regular ant. And the one on the right, picture B, is an ant that has been infected with a parasite. So the abdomen is black on one, and the abdomen becomes red in color um, once the female has been infected with the parasite. Um, it also is 
usually like held upright instead of down when it's infected, which is kind of strange. Um, and then that parasite will get kind of in the life cycle of this ant um, be transferred. The ant also with the infected abdomen tends to look like these berries. So there is possibility that um, there's also a little bit of mimicry where the infected ant kind of blends in with the berries. All right, commensalism is where one benefits and there's no cost or no negative effect to the other. So one of those examples is what we call cattle followers. And there's different kinds of birds who follow cattle, um, cows, capybaras, and different organisms. So it doesn't negatively affect the capybara or the cow, but the bird benefits um, because it gets food from insects. Um, and it could be mutualism because the birds um, might eat insects that are bothering the animal, um, but largely it could be also commensalism. So on the upper right, there's a blackbird um, with a cattle and that picks ticks off the cattle. Cattle um, and the cattle egret on the upper right, these birds um, often accompany large animals and eat the small insects. And the lower right hand corner is a bird called a tyrant flycatcher on the head of a capybara, which is the largest rodent in the world. Um, and it eats the insects. So it might be mutualism, might be clansalism, but either way, one of them is definitely benefiting. Um, another example is the top picture is a double toothed kite, which is a type of um, like a, a raptor. And it will follow these groups of capuchin monkeys and the raptor is too small to eat the monkey, but it benefits um, because when the monkeys troop through the forest um, and make a lot of noise, they kind of drop things and little lizards and insects will get flushed up. And then the kite, the um, raptor, will eat that as its prey. So it doesn't affect the monkey, but the kite definitely benefits. And then in the bottom, you have a bird called a cuckoo, which is following a herd of peccaries, which are wild pigs. And the cuckoos eat insects, including caterpillars and small vertebrates. Um, as the peccary run through the forest, they make a lot of destruction, and that comes up as a food source. Another example are these birds that we call obligate or professional ant followers. And they literally follow army ants and um, these mixed kind of birds that do this really are just eating um, things that follow the army ants. Mutualism is really cool because it's a relationship where both species benefit. So in this example, we have a hummingbird and this flower called a heliconia, and they have kind of adapted so much together that you can see the curve of the hummingbird's beak is a perfect match for that heliconia flower. So they have adapted together to rely on one another for survival. Another example is this um, tree and ant relationship where they rely on each other. So this is an acacia plant that provides a home or container for the ants to live in. Um, and these plants lack defense compounds and the ants kind of will protect them. So the ants will protect the plant. And then the ants will also get a food source from the plant. Um, so the ants not only defend the plant from their hosts or the plant host from other things, they will attack an animal that attempts to climb it. So they really do work together. Another cool example is leafcutter ants. You'll learn more about those later. But leafcutter ants will cut down leaves and they what they do, they don't actually eat the leaves. They take the leaves back to their little homes. Um, and they bring them out into the ground and they will cultivate a fungus, which then they will feed. So the fungus that they cultivate, basically these little ants are farmers. They chew the leaf edge into a pulp and they put it in, into wherever they're going to kind of build this fungus. So the fungus gets dispersed from as a food source um, once the ants have cultivated it. The benefits of each of the species is that the ant gets access to energy it wouldn't normally have, and the fungus, although most of it gets eaten, is it's still getting amino acids from the ant and is growing. So mutualism. Another cool one um, is the relationship between fig wasps, a tree, um, and this other little tiny um, insect. 